Hey skiers, I'm Jeff from SkiEssentials.com. And I'm Bob, how's it going? Welcome to our narrow twin tip comparison for 2024. Bob, this is the first year that we've done two specific twin tip comparisons. I was gonna say, happy twin tip day number two. Thank you. you. Can you tell how excited yes. I am? <laughs> I'm just glowing. Um, but no, I, I do think this is fun. Yeah. Uh, we were kind of just chatting casually before we turned the camera on and there's a lot of park skis up here. And I feel like that's something that we've we've missed in these comparisons in the past is like true we're really truly focused on park skis for the majority of this this video. Yeah, and it's a real kind of interesting distinction between our wider twin tip comparison, which oh, had certainly a lot more skewed into the more free ride side of the spectrum. Yes. Whereas this we see a lot more symmetry and a lot more competition applications. Yeah, a ton of like really good competition skis yeah. up here, which I think is is really cool and a lot of them are skis that like, at least in what we do, don't often receive a lot of attention. Right, I mean, they they tend to be more like a race ski where it's a specific tool for a specific job. Right, yeah. And then there's others up here that, that don't, that blur that line, that go right to all mountain. Yeah, so. well, it's kind of interesting, like this side of the wall over here, as, as we're gonna go narrowest to widest, this side, certainly has less like soft snow application yeah. but then like there's just some interesting distinctions among like even the first three skis yep. are like interestingly different totally for different reasons than like those last three skis yeah so yeah i think it's going to be fun yeah and some a, nice new models up here and quite a few yeah returning ones as well so yeah all good things yeah so we'll get right into it and I do think this is going to feel a little bit different than any comparison yeah, we've sure. ever done before. We'll so do a, do a lot of flexing of skis. There's going to be a lot of flexing. <laughs> there's going to be a lot of weighing um, and kicking things off. This is a really fun ski to start with, in my opinion. This is the Oblivion 84 from Head. Uh, they do not go into very specific details on how the ski is built. But what I can confidently say about it is that it uses a wood core and that has <laughs> true vertical sidewalls, which to me is like the most important thing about this ski, this at is least like, from the construction perspective. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, but like this is like as much of a real ski as you're going to get up here. Like it is 100% a real ski. Yeah. True wood core and it's not like a lightweight or like an no. ISO wood core yeah. or anything. It is a true like dense wood core, which is reflected in the weight and then you truly get like tip to tail vertical sidewalls in fact the vertical sidewall goes all the way through yep. the tips and the tails so really cool build um, it is 1960 grams which is going to be very likely one of the heavier skis that we see in this entire comparison even though this is the narrowest ski i mean it's thick you know and we'll, yeah. we'll talk about thickness as well but like this is one of those thicker profile skis yep. from a sidewall perspective for sure. Yep, absolutely. Um, I wanna look at the, the shape in a second here, but before we do that, the flex is noticeably softer in the tips and tails, leaving this kind of thick underfoot section that you were just looking at pretty darn stiff. And it's also a 20.2 meter turn radius. This is a ski after my own heart. This one has really just been catching my eye lately. It's really cool. Yeah. yeah. And then from a shaping perspective, it is a lot of camber. And the only reason why I say all camber is because when you decamber it, you do get a tiny bit of rise yeah. up in the tips and tails there. Um, but just an insane amount of camber. You know, there's like, what, a centimeter of camber in each ski? I mean, it's Probably. really, lo it's loaded. I mean, it's, it's more than that. that. Yeah. Um, and then there's really no taper in this ski at all. And one thing that I regret not being able to include is the Oblivion 94, yeah. which would be down there on your end of the wall um, and really has a different shape and a different kind of flex and feel than the 84. So speaking to the performance of this 84, it's been a couple years since I've skied it. Like when I skied it, it was that white and red top sheet mm -hmm. or at least filmed it. Uh, it's been a, been a while since we've filmed me skiing it. Um, Emily got on it this season in our, our media shoot, or one of our many media shoots. And this ski, like, if you've been on a competition style park ski before, that's pretty much exactly how it feels. It is really good in the park. 
Um, and then kind of coming back to shape here, like those, the skis on this wall that are really good in the park will generally always have something that's a true center mount. So this ski has five centimeters of mount points from this true center all the way to minus five. It isn't symmetrical in its side cut, which is interesting just compared to a lot of skis that we're gonna look at, 121, 84, 110. Um, but just the shape and the whole vibe and feel of this ski truly feels like a competition style park ski and almost like a half pipe ski. Yeah. And another ski that like would have been interesting to include is the Studio Zero or like the Revolt, I think it's 84. 84 now, is it? Yeah. Yeah. So it's like these narrow cambered torsionally stiff skis tend to excel in the pipe because they have really good edge grip. And then the other thing that I think that this ski could be cool for, which might sound crazy, is a ski instructor. I don't think that's crazy at all. You want something that's mobile and durable and yeah. just easy to get around on, but still right. that has the performance of a real ski. Yeah, and like the feedback. Yeah. Like, you know, I feel like you see a lot of ski instructors on <clears throat> camp, like narrower, cambered, directional, pseudo front side skis. Right. And like this isn't that far from that, but it also happens to have a twin tip. And when you put a twin tip, especially with a long turn radius like this, you can manipulate the ski more for like demonstration purposes. Yeah. So I think it's like a really good park ski for somebody who wants grip. You know, generally, <clears throat> generally that's like we think about that in in terms of, of a park or a pipe skier. But if you're kind of a a true competition focused slope style skier i could see this working really really well too it's not drifty or right. like it doesn't have like like if you're trying to ski like your favorite skier from the bunch it's not going to let you do that particularly easily but it just has strength and responsiveness to it very much a traditional twin tip in the traditional mold like when they first started building twin tips this is more of what they totally look like from a shaping perspective yeah which is interesting because we we've said that about the now the widest oblivions now, right that in their class they kind of have some of that like i hesitate to say old school but like at this point like kind of yeah. old school twin tip vibes well especially when you compare it against some of the newer stuff like that revolt 90 absolutely or certainly more of that modern and progressive twin tip style uh which color do you want to put back on the wall uh black facing out yeah i agree I don't think we, I think we had white facing out before. Well. <laughs> is that one of those skis where like you got to buy You and pairs? I have to buy a pair and then yeah. swap. Or like and convince your friend to buy them yeah. and then like I can have two black skis. But then the circles don't line up. So you got to, no, that wouldn't It'll help. never work. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Um, and then I think this is very different than yeah. that. You know, like talk about opposites one millimeter apart. Yeah, very interesting what Atomic does with this Bent 85 and also just in general and then within the Bent series as a whole. This is an outlier. It is not built like the Bent 90, 100, 110 and so on. Um, the, the Bent 85 has uh, kind of more of a high-end durable construction. So yep. we're dealing with a Densolite core. It's more of a composite core. And you can kind of see it in the weight, 1,840 grams. So it's a little bit heavier for having that composite. You know, basically they're just taking a bunch of wood and, and particle boarding it together and adding a lot of glue. You want to hand me a revolt, or a, uh, sorry, a bent 90? Yeah. Just for fun, since um, we're going to do a lot of flexing and weighing. And in addition to that build, they also do it with more of a cap construction as well. So very minimal half sidewall underfoot here and then the rest of it is full cap. So we're seeing a move towards cap with uh, bent 90, but nothing like this, which is a lot more fully capped. Um, not to cut you off, but although this ski is narrower, it is heavier than the bent 90, which is something that we've talked about before, but yeah. I think is always worth like bringing up a reminder. Um, this one fits a little bit more into you're a recreational skier who's looking for kind of an entry into the twin tip world. Yeah. The value of this thing really makes it stand out. 
Um, it's pretty rare that you see them flat like this, Jeff. We have a lot of these in the, in the building that are system oriented yeah. with tip protector, tail protector, and then a system binding. So I actually think this is pretty cool seeing this thing flat. Um, <clears throat> just looks like kind of more of a legit ski than, yeah. than the system. But yeah. uh, again, you're getting a really nice value out of this thing. So if you go for that system route, you're getting skis and bindings for a decent price. I was actually looking at a set of this for my nephew earlier today uh and it was somewhere in the you know mid 500s i think for ski and binding so which is yeah it's a really nice deal it's about as affordable as it gets yeah and like they're gonna outlast the sun you know like these things are just built to last you that's know like quite a claim four and a half billion years i'm calling it right <laughs> now <laughs> but in terms of flex you know, very actually energetic. Yeah. I skied these at Loon in the rain this year. Yeah, you and Emily both, I got some fun footage of yeah. rainy day, Bob and Emily bent 85 footage. I had never skied one before, and I was just like, well, today's the day. I mean, who better to really put it through its paces than you and Emily? Right, and and that was kind of the main, the main finding was like, what a great New Hampshire rainy day ski. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, yeah. It's, they're responsive enough, they're energetic enough, like there's not like a a super floor on these skis like the ceiling is mid-range yeah um, but you know just from quickness edge to edge and the ability to get from one turn to the next there's nothing wrong with this bent 85 yeah um, it's just it's not a five millimeter narrower version of the bent 90 right and i think that's a, a, just an important worth, distinction always worth talking about yeah um, it, it, it like you said it is it's kind of its own thing in the bent collection yeah and i feel like it's it's often like shunned or just like overlooked because because it's a denser lightwood core right. Be, like because just on paper it doesn't look special and sure it's not tremendously special but it's very valuable and there's a lot of skiers out there that don't have a big budget or don't want to create a big budget right. whether they have the means or not like a lot of people don't want to spend a thousand dollars on their skis and bindings and then like if you're skiing 15 days or less a year and you want to just fun loving super durable long lasting ski like what yeah. why not why not no nope. hard to hard to do worse um you know good positive camber underfoot this is a little bit more a little bit more rocker than your <coughs> excuse me than your oblivion 84 over there um and in the 185 do i get a radius here oh goodness it's right in there with the Rest of the writing, 17 something, I think, right there. 17.6. 17.6. So shorter turn radius, a little bit more of that uh, increased taper versus the more traditional Oblivion. Also more directional. Yep. You know, this it's less of like, it's really not a park ski. Like the right. way that I think about the Bent 85 is it is a, it's a directional, affordable twin tip, like a fun loving all mountain ski. But the really even the bent ninety is is more of a true park ski. Yeah. Um, now that said, Bob, you've used this term before, which I really like, park curious. Yeah. For your park curious, youthful skier, a bent eighty five is a great choice, and yeah. like you can progress reasonably far in park skiing before it becomes kind of like inappropriate. Right. So, while I say it's not a park ski more of a park ski than a Maverick 86C. Sure. So, um, and then this is funny. We got just like a lot of skis over <laughs> here. So I don't know, really know why we did this, but this ski comes in two different colors. So we brought both of them. Uh, this is the Revolt 86 from Vocal. There are, how should I say this? A lot of Revolts. And sometimes it's a huge, yeah, it can, it's a can huge get a little line. confusing yeah. because it's not just like a linear progression through them where like Revolt 90 is more of a park ski than the 96 while also more of a park ski than this. Yeah. So it's a little just, it's a little interesting. So this is the Revolt 86. This uses a multi-layer wood core um, and actually pretty similar dimensions to what we saw in that Oblivion 120. Uh, 86, 110. Um, do you have a turn radius on yours? Mm, probably not. Oh, it's definitely shorter with those, with those dimensions. Um, but 
pretty straightforward shape here and, and a reasonable build. I like to think of the Revolt 86 as essentially like right in between those first two skis that we looked at there. So it's not as focused as being a park ski as Oblivion 84. And it's not quite as like, it's not just a intermediate directional all mountain ski like a Bent 85, but it has kind of both of those elements to it. So vertical sidewall underfoot, pretty much full vertical sidewall. It does have like a tiny bit of cap, but then it tapers to cap just where my hands are. And that's also paired with a pretty decent amount of tip and tail rocker in this ski. So certainly much more than we saw in that Oblivion 84 to start with. Um, giving this ski, in my opinion, a very well-rounded personality um, I do think it's best for really a younger park ski, park skier, I think. Um, I, I do think there are some all-mountain capabilities here, but it doesn't quite have the torsional stiffness or precision as the Oblivion 84, which takes away some of its capabilities as an all-mountain ski. But on the other end of the spectrum, it kind of like boosts its performance as a park ski at least for a developing park skier, which again, that's like why these first three skis are super interesting to me because the Oblivion 84 is like your established really, really good park skier. Yeah. And then the Bent 85 is like your true beginner park skier. And then this is like in between those things. Yeah. A lot of the kids that I coach who are you know, 13 to 18, they come through this ski during their progression as a skier. So, you know, when they're really young, they generally start on a system or a Bent 85. A lot of them ski like the, uh, the ARV 84 system that we have a lot of. Yep. And then they outgrow that by the time they're like 10. And then a lot of them kind of transition to a ski like this, which works really, really well because it's kind of taking the performance in the park to the next level, but giving you reasonable all mountain performance as well. And then from here, as they specialize, you'll see them gravitate to things like Tom Wallace Pro, like Revolt 90, like ARV 88. In fact, these three skis right here are, well, throw a couple of them over there into the mix, but probably the, in my opinion, three of the hands down best slope style skis in the world. Yeah. So this is like a really cool, I hesitate to call it stepping stone ski because I feel like that comes through with like negative connotations, but that's how I think about the, the Revolt 86 here is kind of a, a stepping stone ski or a bridge from a system synthetic core ski to a true dedicated park ski. Um, this thing has been around for a long time. I don't know if you remember the first time. Oh, it's it, like, it I was... think 2018 was one of the first years I skied this thing. I wanted to say it, 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 yeah, it hasn't always been called Revolt. Right. Because it was Bash, right? Yeah. Bash 86, and now we're Revolt 86. It has been around for a long time, um, and it's, it's, uh, it's not surprising to me because these simple, like a, a simple ski like this, it kind of stands the test of time. Yeah. Like it, it'll keep doing what it's designed to do. And I just remember being actually pretty impressed. I remember it like that one of the first ski tests we did, skiing this with Marcus, who's three inches taller than I am. Yeah. And we we're both on this 180, I think. And just skiing kind of on Groomer, down Perry Merrill, kind of next to each other, and being like, wow, this is actually a whole lot of fun. Like, yeah, good, I mean, like it's... good enough energy. You know, you just yeah. think, of, uh, think of these skis as being really park specific, but then you can put a couple of six foot two and over people on them and like for an intermediate looking for something that's just fun to knock around the hill. Totally. Like there's definitely worse options out there. And this is, this is one that interestingly comes with a single mount point, which is two centimeters back from true center. Yep. And I would say that a ski like this, um, certainly allows for some customization of that mount point. Even though you're not seeing a range like we did on the Oblivion 84, to me with this shape, you know, there's, there's no, no frills right. through the center of the ski here. You could really do a variety of different things. Like you 
true, you probably have five centimeters of mount yeah. point range on this ski, depending on what you want to do. So this is pretty much ideal for what we were describing, like kind of that stepping stone skier that's moving from a more entry level ski to maybe something else in, in a few years. That minus two is going to be great, but if you, you know, if you wanted to go true center, I certainly wouldn't stop you. Right. So, cool ski. And multiple, multiple colors. Yeah, and like, like you were saying about Bent 85, and I mean, really a lot of these skis, really good value. Yep. This one's a Faction Prodigy 1, and just kind of, you know, nice to have Faction covered on multiple levels here. I agree. In a narrow twin tip comparison. Yep. Um, so most of our time has been spent on the wider Prodigy series of skis, and it's interesting because as a twin tip, these things can move from something that's a lot more park focused all the way up to the wider, you know, backcountry freestyle oriented, you know, Prodigy 3 and, yeah. and, and whatnot. So uh, nice to have the narrow one in here, you know, 88 underfoot. Um, I want to see if their scale is right. Pretty close, 40 grams off. So 1790 on our scale in this length here. What is this one? A 178. Um, and just a lot of fun to be had. A little bit denser of a build here. We have both poplar and ash going on. So nice density. Uh, and then that does kind of stop. We kind of, we'll see some variations with where these skis sidewalls stop and where the cap begins. Your revolts earlier, you know, more yeah, interesting cap. progression here. Yeah. yeah. Oblivion, full sidewall. Yeah. Uh, Helix will be back to full sidewall. So we'll sight. Yeah. And really all that's doing is adjusting kind of where the swing weight is emphasized. So when you're going to that thinner, uh, thinner cap portion in the tips and the tails, you are then just kind of making it a little bit easier to complete rotations and put more emphasis right in the middle. So yeah, that's less, kind of what you're looking less for. Less weight and less torsional stiffness too. Yep. Yeah, and then thicker side, uh, thicker edges on this ski, thicker sidewalls. Uh, into the ski, we'll see some interesting movements with uh, how skis approach durability. Obviously, you're probably going to be smashing these things around, but it is cool to look at the difference in where the in, in how thick the edges are in some of these skis. So that's an interesting part from Prodigy for sure. And then flex, you know, kind of what you'd expect. A little bit softer in the tips. You're getting it's not too thick. You know, when you compare the thickness to like that head. We start to see that thinning of the of that base material here, that that full core profile. So a uh, little bit more progressive of a flex throughout the ski, but definitely falls more in the park side. We're not quite at studio uh, in terms of symmetry, but it's still very much right there with uh, you know full full park. So 120, 88, 112. If you kind of compare it to that 120, 86, 110, you know, there's an interesting drop in taper from tip to tail on yeah. these skis. One thing that I think is, is worth pointing out about that ski is it is longer tip rocker than tail rocker. Yeah. It's like 20% tip rocker and 15% tail rocker. So it, I agree with you. I'm not, I'm not fighting you or arguing with you by any means. Fight? It, you want to? All right. Uh, I was going to give it the title or I, I put it in the class of, let me see before I say something that I regret, easily top five all mountain <coughs> skis on this wall and the best all mountain ski on my side of the wall. Yeah. I um, mean, it even says it right here, all mountain twin tip. It, well, I mean, it is. It's a directional twin <laughs> yeah. tip. You know, when you compare it, um, compare it with the other faction yeah. that we're going to look at that studio. It is, there is a difference there. So I think that's cool. And then I'll, again, I'll just keep cutting you off. I just Go need the it. one with the sticker on it. Um, I really like that Faction speaks to this stuff and it makes sense given kind of their heritage and their focus as a company. Mounting position. There's a big red square on the sticker on the ski that talks about mounting position. Yep. And I like the way that they describe it. A subtle difference in mounting position can greatly enhance your skiing experience. I will also say that it could hurt your skiing experience because you can mess up a mount point. Your ski technician will determine which option serves you best. So I like that part. Yep. It's always good to like 
discuss this with a tech rather than demanding something that might right. not work. Like, yeah, check with the tech. Uh, for this ski, we recommend Progressive. Now, Bob, can you grab that other studio with the sticker on it and read the last sentence of that ski? Oh, I need my glasses for this, Jeff. For this ski, we recommend New School. Yeah. So I really like that Faction kind of has this like graphic on their ski. I was going to say printed, but it's not. It's just a sticker that's calling out kind of the differences among these skis. So like that's the progressive mount point that they recommend for Prodigy. Yeah. There is a New School line on Prodigy. So let's, let's do a little, little test here. Um, if you wanted to kind of buy a Prodigy, have more of the all mountain shape, even on the new school line, you know, you're not true center. Not true, yeah. So it's just like interesting how all these things kind of shake out. Um, and there's no reason why you couldn't buy this ski, go new school line. I mean, heck, you could probably even go a couple centimeters further forward than that. Right. But it is like, I just think a nice visual representation and a nice like way to look at and talk about the differences and the intentions of these skis. Yep. No, I agree 100%. Anything else before I put it away? I kind of hijacked your Prodigy 1 discussion. That's it's a we great ski. <laughs> it's super fun. I think we had Emily footage in this video, so technically on the women's graphic. Yep. But like, it, it's one of those skis where every time I get a chance to ski it, really, honestly, anything in the Prodigy line, I'm just like, yep, this is fantastic. Yep. Like, I could ski this every day and be perfectly happy um, which I think is cool and like there's a lot of skis really the first three skis like I don't know that I could say that about those three skis sure I could ski Oblivion 84 and Revolt 86 as park skis and be very happy with them as park skis but outside of the park they I don't know leave some things to be desired yeah. in some situations where Prodigy 1 is, is a pretty darn well-rounded ski for 88 underfoot I like how it comes in the 185. Is that the length, the longest length 184, there? 184, but 184. Yeah. yeah. No, it's big ski. Yep. Um, next ski is, is very different than the Prodigy. We're really kind of moving into an interesting series of skis here uh, with like Captus and M390 kind of being exceptions to that. But the others, we're, we're going to talk about some really good park focused skis through here and I do feel like when you get into the the park focused world the differences are pretty subtle and it's just like it comes down to feel mm -hmm. there's less like there's less performance differences to point to and it's more just matching a feeling to a skiing style or even just a feeling to something that you like the sound of. So Helix 88 is a totally symmetrical ski. That's This is the first totally symmetrical ski that we're going to look at. And I'm pretty shocked how many there are. I think there are three. And that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> Like, it, there aren't too many fully symmetrical skis out there, and really Tom Wallish Pro is so close that it could almost be four, and then ARV 88 is not far off either. But this one is truly symmetrical. It is 118, 88, 118. Uh, this is a 175 centimeter length. This ski is 1,700 grams, thanks to the combination of poplar, bamboo, and carbon. And this ski is like insanely springy. Yeah. It ha I mean, a lot of Liberty skis are. I feel like we, we use that, those adjectives to describe Liberty a lot. But this is, is light and snappy. So I think it's it best as a park ski. I think anytime we look at a symmetrical ski, I don't know. People, somebody could disagree with me if they want to, and that's totally fine. But like the, they're built for park skiing. Yeah, you're, out, you're at least going to be have some type of leaning towards that. Yeah, whether you know it or not. I mean, you know what it feels like to ski moguls on a center-mounted ski with a lot of tail behind you. Yeah, it's super weird. It's super weird, and it's hard, and like that's true in trees or like really anywhere other than yeah. the park or off of a groomer, and even on a groomer, like it, it 
it forces you to kind of change your skiing style yeah. and be more centered and stuff like that. So among these, what I will classify as competition focused park skis or like dedicated park skis, this one is one of the lightest and one of the snappiest. So with that comes a lot of quickness. So a couple things here. If you're like really focused on high level rail tricks, a lot of spinning on and a lot of switch ups and a lot of spins out, this is great. So like maybe you like do a ton of rail jams and you want a ski that's just lightning quick. Helix 88 is awesome. Same, same concept like if you're doing switch triple corks and stuff like that, like swing weight is it's something that you should consider. Now, I don't think anybody watching our videos are doing switch triple corks or maybe they are maybe they are i don't know but it's great at those things but because it's lighter and because it has kind of this like springy more energetic flex pattern it's not the strongest thing in the world so what i find happens with the helix 88 is really high level park skiers that love this ski tend to be pretty lightweight yeah and for them it works really really well you know, take somebody like like Colby Stevenson, who we see skiing the poacher over there. I would venture a guess that if you put somebody like him on a Helix 88 and asked him to do a double cork 1620, he, he wouldn't necessarily like it. Or it would at, at least like require him to be a little bit more precise on landings than something like a poacher. So it's just while we're dealing with pretty subtle differences, I think those are the things that you have to point out. Right, and like you said, the feeling like a level of comfort. And yeah. I think that's big for skiers to know about themselves. Yeah, like what, what makes you feel best on your skis? Is it quickness and energy? Yeah. Or is it vibration damping and strength? Right. Because and that's gonna be like kind of the theme among a lot of these skis. Yeah, and then you don't mind a little extra weight if you're on exactly. that side. And like really, considerable extra weight right it's not just the difference of 100 grams yeah like i don't know grab that poacher let's let's see granted we're in different widths here but still 1700 grams at most in this ski over 2000 yeah 2020 so there's just like there's just differences among these skis and and really, we could have grabbed this one instead of a poacher uh, honestly would have been a better comparison <laughs> let's throw it on there then yeah Almost 2,000, yeah. so 1,950 grams in this site. Yeah, and this site's pretty fun. Um, taking some of what we talked about before with like uh, the Atomic and the Revolt being stepping stones, and I know that you've talked about this a lot with, with your athletes, that pretty much at some point, most skiers are gonna go through this, and for a few reasons. Um, site 88, super durable, Again, really, really strong ski, like tank-like qualities yeah, to this thing. Um, comes in, you know, like a 159, 169, 179. So there are sizes set up for a lot of different size skiers. Um, and then it also just has like a lot of splay. Like we definitely see more dramatic splay in this ski than in some of the others so far. We do have that nice rocker, but it pretty much goes right to splay here in the tail as well so it just makes like switch riding takeoffs landings kind of in that progression process a lot easier um, and that's kind of where this thing comes in handy for a lot of skiers that are just kind of starting their park adventure um, starting or like excelling yeah because i've had kids um like you said they they move on to that ski in their progression, and I'm thinking of a particular athlete uh, who I'm, I'm not going to drop his name because he's a, a minor, and I don't know the legality <laughs> of that. Um, but he is, he is, you know, I coached him when he was 10, 11. Um, I think he's 16 now. Might even be 17. I have no idea. I have some idea. 16 or 17. Um, and he has turned into a phenomenal park skier, and he still skis the site. Yeah. So it's like. It's a, it's a ski that you can progress into really easily, but then it can, it can carry you through the next four, five, six, seven, eight years of progression. 
Um, <clears throat> the key here and with poacher is that fiberglass, so that triaxial fiberglass weave that is basically like the whole core, the whole aspen yeah. core is wrapped in this fiberglass sock. And with a lot of fiberglass comes a lot of epoxy. Yeah. So that's adding to the weight of the ski as well as the durability. Yeah. Um, but full sidewall on this thing and all the way around, kind of like what we talked about with the Oblivion, like real ski construction going yeah. on here for sure. Um, and then for measurements, what do we got? 116, 88, 110. So a little bit even slighter of a drop in that taper, just leaning a little bit more towards symmetry. Uh, and then pair that with the more sym symmetrical uh, splay shape. And you're kind of dealing with kind of that entry level into, you know, total symmetry. Yeah. No, and like for a lot of skiers, this is this is as close as they ever get to symmetrical, even like really dedicated high level park skiers. Yeah. Not everybody needs or wants to be on something truly symmetrical, which you see reflected in like athletes' own choices. Like we'll we'll look at it here with, with the Tom Wallace Pro. Um, but yeah, this is kind of the this is that point where it's getting so close that it's really, really good in the park. Yeah. Skis switch really well. Like sometimes when your tip is a lot wider than your than your tail, when you turn around to ski switch, like it just is a little weird. Yeah, it can actually be good sometimes because like the way that the tip finishes a turn is fun. But generally, you want to be at least this close to symmetrical. And what's that midsole line about three, two and a half, three back from center there? That's what I would say. Yeah. The. Um, I don't necessarily know the significance of this raised ridge on this ski, but I'm really interested to find out. Yeah, so that raised, that's your true center line. Yeah. That was my, that was my assumption. So they do put a midsole line on here that's, yeah, say three centimeters back from true center, but they know that, they know people are mounting this thing center. Right. And that's kind of what that, that raised little ridge is indicating. Um, durability it, off the charts. Yeah, and it does go down to a 149, I just noticed as well. So. Yeah, I was going to say, when you were reading off, did you start with 159? Yeah. I was going to I was gonna correct you and say there's a 149 yeah. because I know young 11-year-old park skier that I coached was not skiing a 159. And does the Midnight follow those same sizes too, do you think? Midnight might go 139, but now you're really yeah. putting me on the spot. But right. Midnight is... Um, <laughs> Really exactly the same ski. Yep. Uh, so next ski up here, this is the new Armada ARV. I'm going to take that one because it's got all the fun information on the back of it. Um, this is the new ARV 88 from Armada. New ARV line is really exciting. We've talked about it quite a bit now, and, and we've got two skis in this comparison. Yeah, there's the other one down yep. there. It was hiding from me. Um, the 88 is certainly the most competition focused of all the ARV skis and like really one of the most competition focused skis that Armada makes now and I would venture a guess that you'll see most like slope style focused Armada athletes on this ski but maybe you'll see some on the on the 94 down yeah. there and then of course Henrik just skis Henrik's ski so he's he's the outlier for Armada athletes. I suppose Phil, Phil is too, but Phil doesn't really compete anymore, so I'm I'm kind of putting him in a different a different category in my mind. Um, but this thing's interesting. Poplar wood core in this ski, so we do see a, a slight progression in the wood core of the ARVs. And this one actually has considerably different shaping than some of the others, but it, they all I suppose they all follow the same theme. This one just feels like it's, it leans more toward the camber side. Mm -hmm. So anyways, poplar wood core, uh, wedge wall is huge with these skis. So that's this concept of the side wall basically being like angled to integrate with the wood core. If you think about like the force of hitting a rail, if you had a vertical side wall, every time you hit that rail, it would be separating those two things a little bit. This way it's, pushing them together. Yeah. So it's not creating extra bond, but it's at least not actively pushing them apart. And from everything that we've seen so far, I slid a ton of rails on that ARV 94 over there and, and never got a single edge crack. So I think it works. Um, so poplar wood core, wedge wall, 
1,700 grams. So way lighter than we saw here in sight. And one of the reasons why I've been so excited about the new ARV ski is, is because it feels like, it actually feels like a substantial step in the progression of park skis. For Armada coming from? For anybody. From the old ARVs or? I think for anybody. For anything. Okay. I think it's like, this is a representation of what manufacturers are able to accomplish with park skis in the year 2024. So it's light and it's strong. Yeah. And those are two things that have historically been really hard to put together into a single ski. Um, I think Elan's doing an interesting job with Playmaker. I think Atomic pulls it off with Bents. Um, but I think like what Armada is doing here is certainly commendable with that wedge wall. Um, I don't exactly know why, but these skis feel pretty darn supple when you ski them. Mm -hmm. You know, the weight is basically identical to Helix 88, but they certainly feel different. That ski feels a little bit more snappy. This ski has, it has some energy to it for sure, but it has more vibration damping than you might think. Um, now, you want to hold up that ARV 94 real quick and just show uh, rocker profile? Nothing like, you know, you don't even have to get that close. Um, hopefully it comes across on camera, but this ski has considerably longer camber and very high rise camber and really not much tip and tail rocker whatsoever. Yeah. But something that we've been talking about, thanks Bob. You're uh, welcome. That's all we need really. Something that we've been talking about with ARVs is this slight amount of early taper that they've put into it. So that does a couple things. Um, one, it makes it more forgiving in the park. Um, switch takeoffs particularly is where I like to have like a little bit of taper in the tip. The other thing it does is it actually boosts its performance as an all-mountain ski. Yeah. So this ski is really, really, really good in the park. Um, but if you put it back here on the factory recommended, if you place your bindings back there on factory recommended, if you like a cambered 88 underfoot all mountain ski, go for it. I got no issues with that whatsoever. I skied it on a pretty darn soft snow day and, and I had a great time. And you can see that is a true directional mount point. Yes. Um, and even the freestyle recommended line is still like two or three centimeters back from true center actually just measured the other day for an athlete of mine and we kind of collect collectively decided for him that he could even bump up a couple centimeters past that that freestyle recommended line uh, but yeah i had a blast on them just as an all-mountain ski so i think it's really cool what armada has achieved here and we'll say the same thing for this as the 94 and the 100 arv and arw are same skis yep so women's version, different graphic, uh, but same build, same lengths. Yeah. So that's pretty cool that they make are basically making six new skis. Yeah. And then uh, let's see here. Uh, 120, 88, 114. So another good representation that you don't have to be true center to be a really, really good park yeah. ski. And like... Not to take anything away from the site, I think the site is great, but I think it's cool that Armada has, so far from what I can tell, achieved similar durability at a lighter weight. And then it's that, back to like the conversation with Helix 88 here, right. is then it's like, which one is more of a benefit to you as a skier? What do you like to feel on your feet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's just, what a, what a, like, <laughs> what a cool time to be a park skier. I don't know, I just get excited about these things. Totally. Um, and, you know, Lines Tom Wallace Pro is another good example of a ski that's, you know, pro model oriented and just has a lot to offer skiers that are, I would say, on the more technical side of the spectrum. Tom Wallace is a very technical park skier. Right. Like that's, you know, you're looking for high degrees of difficulty Precision. with rails yeah. and groundwork. And um, we're probably dealing with the softest ski here. Nah, I don't know about that. Um, I don't that, know. That chronic, at least in the tips and tails, is going to... This one a little bit? That one's going to have something to say about that. Yeah, very tips and tails. That one is, that one is softer. Um, 
This one uses a maple macro nice, block. Nice round core. flex in here. Like you still get some strength out of that flex. Yep. And basically with maple, and I've been talking about this lately, like think of a maple sapling that just bends. Yeah, I like that analogy. Break. You know, they just don't, they don't ever crack or anything like that. So you're just getting a ton of flexibility out of these skis. And another example of, what do we got? 1,760 grams here? Yeah, pretty light. Pretty light. And another example of a ski that uses, that goes from sidewall to cap. So we're putting more emphasis on playfulness and flexibility in the very tips and tails, and then kind of a step down sidewall in the middle to create that more grippy and energetic feeling underfoot, a little bit more traditional style. Um, this one's pretty darn close to symmetrical. I think you were mentioning it's like two, two, two millimeters. millimeters off, I think. Yeah, not much. Yeah, 118, I mean, 90, 116. It is right there. So yeah, two millimeter drop in terms of uh, tip to tail taper. Uh, and that's making this thing just extremely well balanced uh, overall. And again, just kind of leans towards that um, more technical side of the spectrum. I'd say that's more rocker than we've seen through for a lot of these skis. They're kind of lining it up a little bit. Maybe there's seven millimeter, seven centimeters difference here between where the rocker ends and the sidewall begins. So just a little bit of that flatter spot for more playfulness. I kind of picture, you know, these butters just drifting around on your, on your tails or your, or your shovels. But, yeah. And switch takeoffs. Yeah. I know I keep, I, I'll, I'm sure there are plenty of people that watch these videos that have no idea what I'm talking about, but the way that your tip interacts with the end of the lip on a switch takeoff, having that rocker and taper and roundness yeah. is like, it's just, it, it's just a confidence booster. Yeah. Because catching a tip on a switch takeoff is probably the worst feeling <laughs> on skis ever. Yeah. I mean, I, I doubt too many people would disagree you know it's just a it's uh, a bad thing do you know of tom wallish's many nicknames nope well one of them is pretzel man okay which is pretty easy to wrap your mind around if you have some knowledge of park skiing he Did was he invent he a pretty pretzel? much invented yeah he's he's often credited yep he did not technically invent it i believe cory vanular got the first ever but i might even be wrong with that one um but he is, he was one that really like pioneered spinning off the opposite direction that you spinned on, yep. which is called pretzel. Bob, this conversation is really going nowhere, except did line miss an opportunity to call it the line pretzel pro? I don't, if I had a pro model, I would want my name on it. <laughs> That's fair, fair enough. <laughs> probably the same is true with Tom Wallace. It probably yeah. helps with sales a ton because like, you probably watched the Olympics. Or, and actually, Tom Wallace never skied in the Olympics. Um, but but maybe something like the Honey Badger would be, that would be a better ski for that type of fun name. Sure, yeah. Unless okay. that's another nickname for no, it, it Tom Wallace. No, it just felt like it was worth pointing okay. out. Okay. Um, <laughs> really is to me this this is a, a true park ski um you know a lot of these skis we talk about they're all mountain performance and and i think that's often like represented in in the mount points this has a centered mount point which is pretty much right where my hand is um and then the other mount point is like two centimeters back from that not a huge like no so not that's a huge more compromise. like to me that's like just <clears throat> kind of visually showing like you're right. either this park skier you're, or you're this park skier. Right. You, can mark you are here not or here. <laughs> you are not an all mountain skier. And again, like if you've never skied a center mounted ski as an all mountain ski, it's super weird, and you probably don't ever want to, in, unless you're going to be skiing it in the park as well. Yeah, and that symmetry in if you keep moving that binding part point back, if something's symmetrical like this ninety or almost like that tom it just messes with the way that the ski works. Right. Or is intended to work. Right. Yeah, it really, it, it's similar to taking a directional ski and mounting it center. Right. It feels terrible. Yeah. Take a symmetrical ski and mount it seven centimeters back, it's gonna feel really bad. Yeah. Um, so this is the Vocal Revolt 90. Uh, I was really excited when Vocal first showed me this ski. I've probably talked about this before, but 
I was on a trip in Sun Valley, kind of focused on the new kendo, and we had a whole like presentation and meeting about the new kendo. And at the end of the meeting, they asked if anybody had any questions, and I was like, "What's up with that? <laughs> What's that thing?" <laughs> and I, I felt like I like not insulted, but maybe disappointed some vocal executives when I didn't get excited about their directional ski. Was it like the record scratching and the all conversation stopping and? <laughs> no, it wasn't that bad, and they just did such a good job describing the kendo that I didn't have any questions yeah. about it. But this thing just caught my eye, um, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I truly think this is such a good representation of the modern park ski, yeah. similar to how I was describing that ARV 88. Um, they call this one a light swing weight wood core. <sighs> Vocal's really, like, not annoying, but... It could why be clear. Tell, why don't they just tell us what type oh, of wood it is? It could be clear. Yeah, I would. I would prefer more uh, clarification in the the wood. Um, but anyways, what I think is interesting about this ski is how they like progressively minute, mill it thinner and thinner. Which it's never true cap construction, but like the vertical sidewall gets so thin that that's kind of where you're getting that like light swing weight concept. This ski is truly symmetrical. Um, 1850 grams, really just nice, round, balanced flex pattern in this ski, just a touch stiffer here and, and a touch heavier too. So again, like subtle differences between a lot of these skis. Yep. If you want more lightweight and more quickness, go Tom Wallace Pro. If you want a little bit more strength, maybe for bigger landings, or maybe you're just a bigger skier yourself, go Revolt 90. Um, and then with a ski like this, symmetrical mount point, symmetrical shape. We're gonna see symmetrical everything. Uh, and this is another one, Bob, with quite a bit of tip rocker. Yep, so, and again, tail rocker. To it's gonna be the same <laughs> amount of tail rocker. So that's, for me, where a lot of the kind of modern park ski shaping is coming in, is getting that long tip rocker, long tip and tail rocker, but without much splay. Because you still need an, a long effective edge in a lot of situations in the park like we talked about it with playmaker 101 and we can talk about it with playmaker 91 as well but i had a couple situations on bigger landings on the playmaker 101 where you yeah. found yourself washing out and in the video or in the review we, we talked about why that's not necessarily a bad thing it's just not designed to be a competition ski right. this is it's got rocker up here so you get that catch free like switch takeoff and and buttery performance that I've been talking about, but you have the effective edge, you have enough ski to trust on a big landing. So it truly is a slope style ski. And when, when Vocal talks about this ski, like when the product manager for Vocal talks about the Revolt 90, they're like, that's our pro slope style yep. ski. So, you know, you kind of have to listen to, the, listen to the manufacturers and engineers because they know what they're designing and that's, that's who should be choosing this ski. Totally. Is it's it's pretty one dimensional here, but it really is just an awesome park ski. And you know what's a bummer, Bob? What's that? I like I said, I think these are three of the best park skis in the world. I don't own any of them. I'm sure you could make that alteration. Which one do you think I should go for? Uh I would say the Armada. If you were going to enter a park competition tomorrow, I think that would be your choice. Sure. Yeah. It's like, it's hard to choose. Yeah. I mean, I only, I kind of say that because you're used to the 94, so that that's not a huge departure, whereas. Yeah. I just don't, I don't know. I've never seen you ski. Tom Wallace and I are like the same age. I wonder yeah. if, if I got on Tom Wallace Pro with like a symmetrical mount adjuster pro, like just set it up just like Tom Wallace, yeah. would I become Tom Wallace? I mean, it's, yeah, that's the point of pro models. It's worth testing, yeah. right? 100%. I've never done a right side switch double cork or double rodeo 1080. My switch right 1080s aren't. They don't even exist, yeah. let alone being like the best <laughs> ever. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'd have a tough time just deciding. 
That's and you could okay. throw like that Studio One in there too, and like yep. you could give me any one of them. I actually like for me. This is an interesting conversation, Bob. I think for me, the older I get, when I talk about that switch spinning, yep. like I have less like like snappy takeoff in my legs. Like my legs, they're probably stronger than they were when I was younger, but they're not as quick. Yeah, I hear you. So like, yeah. I feel like a switch takeoff on this ski in a perfect world for like a high spin, like 900 plus switch takeoff, you still need some quickness. Yeah. I feel like these with the longer rocker allow for slightly lazier skiing, which might help me. I don't know. All right. But then, like, this would, like, be a reminder, like, no, 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 like, do your trick, like, yeah. do your, yeah, I don't know. We're wasting way too much time. Do you want to talk about the Captus? I love the Captus. This thing's, I would say, one of the most all-mountain oriented of these twins. So, um, yeah, I was going to go as far as saying potentially the best all-mountain ski on this wall. Yeah, I mean, you like, had mentioned the Prodigy is having a lot of that that capability as well. I just find Captus has some strength that n no yeah. other ski on this wall can really match. And just like because it's basically a narrow Camix, which yeah. is a narrow Atris, yeah. this just kind of takes that next level of being a narrow free ride ski that also has a twin tip. So yeah, I mean, go ahead and use it in the park. Um, but I think that the best part of this thing is it's all mountain application. So poplar wood core, fiberglass, full sidewall, that's kind of taking it a little bit away from Camix, which is kind of a half cap design and just kind of making it a little bit more precise and agile in different snow conditions and terrain. Um, and then we get kind of this free ride taper shape as well in the shovel. Um, but one of the stiffer and snappier yeah, skis. Definitely. Um, and I think that we both felt that when we, we spent some early season time on this last year. Uh, I spent a lot of time on it last year. Yeah, it's one of those ones that doesn't leave your car. You know, you're like, oh, this is Well, I skied it on, uh, on the, the classic soft snow, awesome conditions, Black Crows shoot yep. when most everyone else was on big, wide, nice soft snow skis. And that was really fun for me because I felt like I was at a disadvantage. Yeah. But the Captus like did so well in like pretty deep snow that yep. I just I, I I'm often reminded of that day and that that combined with our experience on it earlier in the season when it was more on like classic groomers and stuff like that. That's that's where I really get my full appreciation of this ski and yep. it is like it is a very well-rounded all mountain twin tip. Yeah, it feels totally intuitive. It's about 1,800 grams, 18-meter uh, turn radius, and it's 178. So a little bit cleaner of a turner than what we've seen. You know, like when you think about Oblivion with its long turn radius, that's on the more traditional side, and then this brings it a little bit more to modern and certainly leans towards that free ride. And then longer tip rocker, then we see tail rocker, leading to that more directional uh, standpoint here. So not a ton of splay. You know, when we look at M390 here next, we'll see less. Um, and that just kind of takes it a little bit out of that true twin tip mold and leans it more into all mountain. Yeah. But as far as 90 millimeter underfoot all mountain skis go that happen to have twin tips, yep. uh, what an absolute treat to ski on this thing. I agree. Um, has everything that we like about Black Crows in terms of quality, uh, snow feel, silence, stability, uh, and just adds that twin tip in for playfulness and creativity. Yeah. So bumps, trees, super easy, really quick, like feels just extremely easy to enter a turn, great energy out of it, uh, and it's just a, it's a pleasure to ski. It, yeah, it really is. Yeah. It's just really fun. Um, and yeah, it, it can work in the park. Did we look at mount points at all? No. I'm just curious. There's this one. Yeah, just uh, one arrow. Arrow line, which is yeah. So the back again, like this isn't the first time I mentioned it in this video. I think where the manufacturer places the recommended line is is always really interesting to look at and is a great example of what the ski is designed to do. Yeah. Where this ski 
is say I mean that's a that's probably seven centimeters back just like a traditional directional yep. mount point and yeah you could go a little further forward than that but it's not symmetrical rocker or, right I don't know why I just flipped everything over it. <laughs> um, but so we've talked about that before. You don't want to go too far forward in the camber profile. So there's a limit to how much of a park ski you can even make this. Right. But I would, this is one of those ones that for a 90 underfoot, I would take this any day of the week and just have this be a one and only. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, and we both own bent 90s as well. You know, this is like one of the few. I don't. Oh, okay. I own a bet 90. I gave it to Chris. Oh, yeah. Well, Chris would love I just it. have a lot of it. skis. I needed the binding. <laughs> it's one, one of those I need a binding situations. Right. Here's a ski. I need this binding. Yeah. yeah. I would rather ski this in an all-mountain format. It's just a little bit more energy and a little bit more pop. Holds yep. up my size uh, a little bit better than a bet 90. Um, yep. You know, feel fine about this, but... This Black Crows Captus is just a whole lot of fun. Yeah, super you, rewarding. Did you say recently, like if you could trade your Bent 90 for a Captus, you'd be yeah, interested in that trade? Yep. Yeah. You could even keep the binding. I'll buy a new binding. <laughs> um, and next ski is the M Free 90 from Dina Star. Um, I'll be honest, it pretty much doesn't belong up here. But it's up here, so we're going to talk about it anyways. The reason I think it's worth including is because I think skiers have learned that M frees are twin tips. Yeah. And because of that, I think it's important to talk about this ski and how much it's kind of not a twin tip. So, interesting ski. I actually think there's a lot of similarities to like how we were describing Bent 85 but up a couple notches. Yep. This ski just has some construction design elements that I think would, would satisfy a, a higher level skier. Um, I've often thought back to our, the warehouse sale that we had this past summer, and I talked to like a young, young kind of free ride enthusiast. He was like 14 years old, I wanna guess, and we landed on this ski. Mm -hmm. And I remember like throughout that process, once we kind of landed here, I was like, what a perfect ski right. for that young man. Like he's much more into like, like he watches Freeride World Tour and like that's his motivation. He wants to be a, a big mountain freeride skier, not Tom Wallish. Yeah. And I think this ski is really cool for that skier. So Polonia wood core in here. So it's very, very lightweight, 1,630 grams. Is that gonna be the lightest ski that we look at? Maybe. It very well could because yep. we're getting into some bigger, bigger stuff over there. Um, and then I do want to look at its flex pattern before we're done here, but it is a directional shape. So a decent amount of tip rocker up here. There is a decent amount of tail rocker, but there's not a twin tip splay back yeah. here in my opinion. So if you're a park skier and choosing the M390, I would say you're more park curious than park focused. And in that situation, fine. Again, kind of speaking to coaching, our organization that I coach for is, is sort of split on the skiing side into freestyle or free ski and free ride. And like the free ride kids, very similar to the 14 year old who I sold a pair of these mm -hmm. skis to, they come into the park every once in a while. Sure. And like if that kind of describes you as like, you like skiing trees and moguls and stuff like that, but you, want to learn 360s or maybe you want to do a 720 or a backflip someday then this is totally fine it's more like when you get into like rail focus and like switch takeoffs and stuff like that where the ski has some limitations but really good as an all-mountain ski a lot of value here um can you guess what the turn radius is of this ski 17.5 20. long i so love it's, it it's not designed to be like <laughs> You know, it's not necessarily just like a cheater right. beginner ski. Like, if this is a real ski and like a 20 meter radius with this shape, you're going to be able to do a bunch of things on it. You yep. make all sorts of different turn shapes. It's not going to feel catchy if you take it into the woods and, or even some softer snow conditions. If you're a really lightweight skier, like a young 14 year old, you'll get some good float out of this ski. 
polonia wood core with this weight feels like, it feels like we're talking about a head core yep so again like you know it's not a noodle it's not like designed to just be like this floppy forgiving ski it's this is a a true ski that like a progressing free rider could get a lot out of um, and similar to that K2 site, this thing is offered in a lot of sizes. I think it starts at a 137 yeah. and goes to 177. Yeah. So goes from like youth to tweener to adult. Right. So a huge range of skier can get on this thing, you know, including a 14 year old aspiring free rider. Yep. So there is like, you know, that, that kid that's entering a junior program, whether it's an all mountain weekend program or more of that free ride, like this is a great option because of that light weight. I think that that's a huge selling point for this ski. Um, you know, when we get to some other, even like that bent as a, the 85, as it gets shorter, still kind of feels a little heavy. So for Sorry, I was distracted by the gravitational pull graphic on the line Tom oh, Walsh nice. Pro. <laughs> yeah, they got some weird stuff going on there. Feels like high school, I got like, my eyes got pulled over there. Um, at any rate. Yeah, sorry. Uh, a good, I think this is a better option than most when it comes to small lengths. Yes. So I would put a kid on this, like, no problem because it's light. Your kids are getting cr close to M390 category. Yeah, they're close. They still like the light foam core twin tip, K2 twin tips, well, though. Well, give it a couple years, yeah. and they might be pushing through those. And, and on to the next, and enter yeah. a ski like that. Um, I love these graphics. We were looking at this the other day. Oh, I don't know awesome. how they made it like so three-dimensional, but they did a really nice job with this Studio One. Um, really, it's just like really it pops. Yeah, for sure. And another totally symmetrical ski, very competition-oriented, uh, slope-style focused, and just ready for that top level. So symmetry, um, we do get a poplar wood core with carbon stringers in here. Um, and then- And rubber. And rubber, we get, get that, that rubber, rubber stomp, stomp pad. Yeah, you can't yeah. see it. I was wondering if you could see it. Can't no, see it. you know, it's, it, it's two strips that are right over the edges on either side underfoot. And I think they said it was like 60 millimeters long or something like that, so. A good portion of the ski is covered in this uh, stomp pad, so that's going to give it certainly more cushioning on uh, landings as well as just more durability overall. Uh, what do we got for dimensions? Symmetrical, here? 120, 120, something. 90, 120, yeah. 19 meter radius. Yeah. yeah, so I mean, this thing is meant to be skied on that new school line as we were talking about earlier. Yep, um, and, and it is like. I was just playing around flexing it, and we did this a bunch before we started filming, too. Um, it's slightly softer than the Prodigy, and I would also say that it's noticeably symmetrical in its flex. Yes. What do we got? 1,740 grams. Yeah, which, like, the sticker doesn't do it justice. No, 1,650 it says here. Oh, I thought it said oh. 8, 1,850. I'm sorry, <laughs> faction. <laughs> well, now I have to read it again. I really got to start bringing my glasses to these things. That's definitely a 6. 16, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's not far off from that. No, um, but very much, so 1750 on the scale here in the 178. You never really, I don't know, they must not make stickers for each length. Does this sticker different from, yeah, they must, because it's yeah, highlighted. Yeah, they do, because they put, yep. Interesting. Yep. Well, there's variances in everything. Plus or minus 50 grams, right? Yep. Um, but yeah, a lot of long camber in this ski, nice and high, good energy coming out of that. Uh, again, when you're, and you can speak to this better than I, when you're carving off a jump, off of a lip, yep. like it's nice to have energy feedback. A hundred percent. You know, so you're getting that, and that's why, you know, profiles like this are really important and more prolific in this range of ski than what we see in all mountain. What a profound question you have asked, Bob. <laughs> when you're carving off a lip, having a snappy poppy ski is even more important than if you're not carving off a lip because if you're taking off on like, like there's a couple different takeoffs in park skiing. Yeah. One is on the inside edge of both skis and then you can like generate like a ton of force with like your hips and just like yeah. your whole lower body. But like I do it a lot where when you're coming into a jump like on both edges, you can't like you can't get your body into like an athletic position. It's like completely wrong, but it's so much fun to do. And then yeah, having a snappy energetic flex is 
is huge because you just get yeah. a little bit of like extra kick. It's not even like lift, but it's like energy off your tail. So I, I'd imagine the carbon plus the camber really makes a big difference with something like this. And that's, yeah, no, the ski is awesome. Uh, I'm like really excited to, I might buy one. I mean, when's pretty last, cool. When's the last time I bought a ski? I don't know. It's been a while, but I would, I would this, really. This would be a good one. I'd, well, I mean, the color is cool. Yep. I don't know. I think they've got a winner there with the studio. Yeah, I think so too. Um, now, we gave a title to something, maybe Captus, as, as best or most well-rounded all-mountain ski. And when we did that, I was, I was hesitant to do so because of this thing. And to me, with, with Bent 90, the award that Bent 90 should get is that it can be the most different things. Yeah, there's a big range. Yeah. yeah. So we've talked about this plenty before with this ski. Um, lightweight wood core. Horizon tips and tails. It is a directional shape, which I want to look at pretty closely here. Um, but before we do, I don't know if I said how much it weighs, 1,800 grams. Um, there's, what, 11, 10, 10 centimeters of recommended mount points on this ski. And while I don't think it's the best park ski in the world, it's still really good. Yeah. And if you put it on that plus six line, like that's, that's a very balanced ski. But then you can go all the way back here to minus four, and it becomes like, I don't know, like a traditionalist ski. Like somebody who like loves skiing trees like at like a slow, methodical pace. Do you know the, like the, t the skier that I'm describing? Yeah, but like I'm about as directional of a skier as you're gonna get, and I'm on the factory line on this ski and I can't quite imagine much of a benefit of going minus four. Going minus four. The I only could make thing, arguments for one, two. The thing that I'm thinking three, of four. right now is my brother. And I was recently at my brother's house and I looked at a pair of his skis and I was like, that's the least amount of tail that I have ever seen on a pair of skis. And he was like, I love those yeah. skis. And he's like, I've described him as like a, an adventure skier. Yep. Like, a survivalist skier like he's in it for the adventure and like the exploration almost more than like the skiing itself and he he loves it so anyways we're kind of we've gone down a bit of a rabbit hole here but there are a lot of different things that this ski can be and I think like when you look at the shape it's pretty obvious why that is so there's a ton of tip rocker up here like same as bent 100 yep you know, it's, and we talked about how good the Bent 100 is as a tree ski all the time. Like this tip rocker really boosts this ski's ability in soft snow, which is just further enhanced by that Horizon tech. There's really not much tail rocker at all. Like barely any, You're right, even the, like less splay. The flex too. just allows it to... The flex is kind of where it comes in, but the directional more. shape, I think is a big contributor to why it can be so many different things. But yeah, very, Manipulative yep. flex or manipul manipulatable? Manipulatable. That Does sounds it? right. <laughs> can't be wrong. <laughs> can't, can't be wrong. Easy to manipulate. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's a very cool ski. Um, I always have appreciated its just its ease of use and its forgiveness, probably yeah. above anything else. It's just so easy to do anything on it. And I've like, I know people point fingers at its, like, lack of torsional stiffness, but I don't find much of that at my weight. No, and, like, I don't care about it at mine because right, the rest of the stuff it does is so good. Right, exactly. Like, I'm not using this in moguls to gain torsional stiffness and make clean carves. I'm no. loving it in moguls because I can literally put it wherever I want. Yep. And that's the benefit in trees, same way around here, like... If you're going to be consistently skiing tighter woods, like this is a huge benefit. Right. Like, you can just swivel it around, forwards, backwards, really get out of trouble, stop on a dime. Yep. You know, skiing with my kids in the woods on, on this ski is just incredibly easy and, you know, not fatiguing in the least and just incredibly fun. And that's kind of the whole point. 
So, you know, we're back to that more all-mountain yeah. shape. If it, had, if it had a tail that was 118, right. it would be a different story. It wouldn't have that maneuverable high wiggle factor that it has. And a really good floater for its width. Again, yeah. like myself, you know, 225 pounds, like I'm going to sink this thing. But anyone lighter, not going to be too bad. But good float for the width for sure. And this thing, this Elan Playmaker 91. Highly you know, maneuverable. Hi, another one that fits that bill for sure. Um, oh, we got on. It might be the softest. We got on the 101. Saying, I, you were saying Tom Walsh. I thought Tom was pretty soft. Yeah, this is uh, might, right might there. Be. Um, you know, we spent more time on the 101 before the 91. Oh, and lightest. Oh, and I kind of. After being on the 101, which I enjoyed, I kind of had my sights set on this a little bit more. Um, for what I liked about the 101, its agility and its quickness and having the carbon tubes underfoot, I thought that the 91 would make more sense, uh, especially for us here in Vermont. And we get a lot of these questions between 91, 101, or 9100 yep. uh, for Bent and some other skis that have wider counterparts, like I ski in New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine. Sure. Like, which one should I get? And I think that the narrower, narrower ones make a lot of sense, especially if it's gonna be kind of a mix between your park ski and your all mountain ski. So having a little bit less width and more quickness, uh, to me, makes sense, and that's where uh, I got along really well with this one in terms of being ag agile, mobile, and just super easy to, to get around. Love throwing these things sideways. That's probably one of my favorite parts. Uh, really just one of the smeariest skis out there. Um, they do use, what do they call it, surf rocker surf technology. Rocker, yeah. So kind of mixing this uh, narrower part underfoot and it gets wider as you get to the tips and tails and just allows the midsection to be a little bit more stout with the edges and tips and tails being just incredibly easy and agile to, to move around. 18.1 uh, meters in this radius in the 180. What did you say? 16, just about 1600 grams. Yeah, and yeah. It's pretty light. We got some, we got some wiggle factor here, pretty Jeff. Light, pretty soft. Yep. Just extremely agile, but in more of a, a park-influenced shape, in my opinion, than, than Bent 90. Probably one of the flatter skis in yeah. terms of rocker. It's where that surf is coming from. Yep. It's just very surfy. Yeah, so that nice blend of having nice thick profile up top plus those carbon tubes and then just a flatter rocker profile makes a lot of sense. And then not a ton of splay, you know, no. it's longer rocker, but really no, you know, like something like the, the site is really kind of the opposite of this, where there's camber to the end and then more splay, more distance between the tails. This one is a lot more gradual. Now, I, I feel like Playmaker 91 is one of those skis similar to Bent 90, where it can be a number of different things for different skiers, but I do think it's it has more freestyle influence in its overall just attitude. Yeah, and like good for Alon for coming out with like two amazing twin tips. Oh, that's like so good! Right yeah. in their first go at it. Yeah, and I like I both playmakers 91 and 101. I'm having such a good time on them because I, I do. Like, they are really fun as yeah. all-mountain skiers, just ripping around the mountain and, like, popping off little natural hits and stuff like that. They're so fun. Um, you know, what's the, what's the shape here? Do you have one with dimensions on it? 122, 91, 116. So, you know, we're not quite as symmetrical as the things that we were looking at over here. Yeah. And I think that's also representative that, like, I think there, you know, I, there's a reason why I didn't put that in my category of best park skis, but among skis with all mountain capabilities as well, it's one of the best park skis in the world. It's yes. so much fun. And like Playmaker 91 to me, and I think we talked about this at some point, felt so similar to that ARV 94, where I was like, this is really fun as an right. all mountain ski, yeah. this is really fun in the park, I don't know which one to choose, and it's like, 
great because it doesn't really matter. Yeah, totally. So I really like these things too. Great bumps, great bump ski. Totally. Had a blast. Yeah. Um, and then I feel like we're, we're kind of transitioning into a, a slightly different world with this Chronic 94 here. Um, Chronic's been around for a long time. This 94 really takes things to another level. Um, I liked your analogy of it uses an aspen wood core because it's a K2 now. Yeah. And I think that's <laughs> oversimplifying things, but if you have any knowledge of the ski industry, it's kind of funny. And then they use this thin tip construction, which again, I think is really cool. And we looked at the flex pattern earlier when we were talking about Tom Wallace Pro and whether it was the softest ski. That thin tip really is changing the flex pattern of the tips and tails. Yeah. So underfoot, this ski is, is quite robust and quite strong, but the tips and tails are so soft that it gives it a very, very playful attitude. Um, over 2,000 grams here. This is one of the bigger skis that we've looked at so far. What length is that guy? 85. Yeah, 185. So pretty big ski. Not surprising that it's over 2,000 grams here. Um, but there's some stability to it. There's some substance to the ski for, for sure. And I really feel like we've, we've moved into a world in this ski where it's like, it's still a really good park ski, but I don't know that you'll see a tremendous amount of people like competing on this ski. It's more of just like a feel good, I love park skiing style park ski. Like I'm gonna make edits and, and yeah. that's like, that's my goal as a park skier rather than like I'm gonna go win the X Games. Cause I feel like if you're gonna go win the X Games, like you just take a Tom Walsh Pro and you're gonna have an easier time. But the mixture in this ski of soft snow performance and like truly like modern soft snow performance, like slashy, smeary, drifty style skiing, that combined with its park skiing performance is just, just awesome. Um, and I like the shape a lot. A lot of tip rocker up here, nice like rounded progressive splay, and then like pretty much the exact same shape in the tail. I would say the tip rocker is a touch longer, but not tremendously not longer. Um, and a couple different lines on this ski. If you guys remember back to the Tom Wallish, how close those two lines were. So here we still get the center line, which on both skis is marked by a C, but the secondary mount point on the Chronic is, is significantly further back. That's more like four centimeters back rather than the two, which yeah. is kind of indicating the increased all mountain performance of this ski better soft snow performance, better float, stuff like that. It is very, very fun to ski and one of the like surprising, kind of very impressive twin tips that we got to ski and test this past season. Yeah, this one came up in conversation a lot when kind of we were asked or had discussions with people like, oh, what's new for 24 that really yeah. catches your eye? Even like reps, yeah, like especially reps. Yeah. They'd be like, what have you guys skied that's cool? It's like, well, Chronic 91 or Chronic 94 and 101 are really cool. And people would be like, what? What? Like those lines, the yeah. twin tips? And be like, yeah, you gotta go, go check them out and go ski them. Yeah, and you know, just the, what you would expect it to be in turn, when you flex those tips and tails, isn't quite the reality of how it feels on your feet. Yeah, you gotta like, think about the whole thing as, yeah. as a single entity. Yeah. And it is pretty strong underfoot. Um, this one's pretty strong too. Yeah. You know, we definitely get that when we talked about the Idolo in the wider uh, twin tip comparison, um, a lot of that comes up from here as well. It's a cool mix of like strength, but an ultra playful shape. Yeah, so we are getting Phil Casabon's input in here, and I feel like, correct me if I'm wrong, but like soft skiing, creative, playful skiing, a lot of groundwork is yep. really what this thing is all about. You're on the right track for sure, and, and you cannot forget about urban skiing. Urban, thank you. Because that is like really these days what Phil is yeah. known for more than anything else, although I will never forget <clears throat> best switch bio 10s and 12s ever. In the game, huh? I think yeah. so. He used to just like roll off the takeoff and do these like switch bio 12 croutons. They know what I'm talking about, Bob. <laughs> just all you all have to do is name a trick after a food or a snack. And Crouton. Yeah. Great name for a grab. 
uh, 2060 grams here, the blend of poplar and ash in the wood core is to blame. So very much in the same realm as that Adolo or as even the outgoing uh, ARV 96. So you're seeing kind of that denser ash wood incorporated in here. Um, yet somehow they make this thing yeah, pretty flexible. Yeah. Uh, you know, sidewall ends about here, so all cap from here. And then what we're really dealing with is this kind of circ circular shaped cut that you were alluding to in both tips and tails. Yeah. And I don't think it's going to come through on camera as much, but the more you look at it, the more you're like, I've never seen a ski shape like that. Yeah. Like very much these wide parts come out here. Like you could literally make this part into a circle. Uh, and then same thing with the tail. Right? Yeah, it's for like, it's it's for long, consistent butters. Yeah, which looks incredibly cool. Like and I'm an, like, and it's one of those challenging. Yeah, yeah, it's one of those maneuvers that like, I am extremely jealous of. Yeah, like I think it's cool. Like big jumps are really cool and really fun to see. But this, it, it's kind of like. Um, I was more into like flatland BMX than dirt sure. jumps or anything like that. I never that. knew that. Do you have flat, band, flat ground BMX tricks? Some. Really? Yeah. But Can you like put your foot in the front tire and like in between the tire and the fork yeah, and I then like tail whip like the rest of the thing around? Yeah, I mean, oh not my for God. 30 years. You got to get you a BMX bike. <laughs> I know. I, you know, it's one of these <laughs> things where a lot of people are posting like vintage pictures of their, you know, their Haros and their GTs yeah. and I'm like, oh man. Did you have a Whatever. BMX bike with like the foam thing on the oh, yeah. top tube of the handlebar? Oh, yeah. oh my God, I would have thought you were so cool. I still do. But, <laughs> but anyway, that's always been more appealing to me. Uh, and that seems to have translated into ski technology as well, where like, yeah, I think the jumps and the slope style and the, and the rails and stuff like that is all really interesting, but my style would be more groundwork. Yep. So that's where this thing seems to excel as well and just gives it a whole sturdy nature to it uh, to go along with that. Yeah, I'd say like fairly one dimensional, but yeah. also like an interesting alternative use for that ski would be for the modern freestyle skier that like that does all the things that you're talking about, but also wants like some soft snow performance. Yeah, because I do think the shape those characteristics they carry over to, to good soft snow performance. No, you can certainly double this that extreme taper to yep. the power. I mean, it's like a DPS yep. shape where there, it's just an extreme uh, taper in both yeah. tips and tails. Kind of the, the main caveat to that is that you're going to be at a more centered mount point on that ski, so you're going to have more ski behind you. Yeah. So like, you know, you could look at that shape and put it next to like an old Rossignol Sky 7. And like the tip is basically the same yep. with like a ton of early taper. Um, but you just when you have more ski behind you like we've been talking about it it takes away it's just intuitiveness from the maneuverability and then it's really just for that skier who is used to that that feel and what you have to do and like the dps it's going to adhere to a 15 meter radius correct so right. short effective edge short turn radius uh 121.94 116.5 so yep on the symmetrical side but right. still not That's what's there. limiting its its directional maneuverability. Yeah. Um, and then the second ARV in this collection, this is the ARV 94. Uh, we looked at this ski briefly earlier, talking about the 88 and kind of the increased rocker in this ski. Um, this ski gets, let's see, what, were, what was the weight in ARV 88? I'm actually kind of curious to do this. What are we, 1730 there? Yeah, 1750. Yeah, all right. So not much heavier. Pretty consistent weight. Um, the real difference between these skis is, is the width and the amount of rocker in them. Yep. So ARV 94 just gets longer rocker like we looked at before. Um, again, I skied this on like a pretty soft snow day, the same day that I was skiing that 88. and. I was just so impressed by this ski's soft snow performance. It is so much fun, um, but pretty 
similar tip and tail rocker. I would say you get slightly longer tip rocker than tail rocker in this ski. Um, we get a 17 meter turn radius and the dimensions here are 123, 94, 118. So a five millimeter difference in tip and tail dimensions. And if you've been following along and, and you've learned anything from this comparison, this one kind of splits the difference between directional all mountain ski and true park ski. And that's like a perfect way to think about its performance. I had a blast even skiing groomers on this ski, like even just linking carving yeah. turns on groomers. It, it's so much fun. And then it, it's agile and soft snow. Like we looked at the rocker and taper in that, that 88, but with the longer rocker, you also get longer taper. So this ski is just even more catch free in soft snow. Um, nice, just even flex pattern. Like it's not stiff by any means, but it's supportive. So if you need to land a big jump, it'll, it'll let you, uh, but then soft enough that it's just super playful too. Yeah, it's just, I'm all, I almost like don't know what to say about this ski because it's just really good. They did a great job. Like yeah. they did a great job. Everyone, like it was hard to have a bad time on the ARV 96. And I think they made that even more impossible with the 94. I think like if you had criticisms of the 96, it was like, Heavy. that's a little lumbering. Yeah. I wish this was a little bit more agile and a little poppier. Yeah. And so that's what you're getting with the 94 here. Yeah. Super good in the park. You know, these skis over here, Studio Zero or Studio One, excuse me. Um, yeah, sure. They, they <laughs> take it up a notch yeah. and just dedicated park performance. But for 99.9% of park skiers, that's probably not true. For 97.7% that's of park much better. skiers, yeah. that's more accurate. Um, you'll, you'll never need anything more than this. And then you can go and take it into soft snow and just ski it as an all-mountain ski and, and have a really good time on it. Um, you know, again, we're not, we're not actually seeing a, a dead true center recommended mount point there. Yeah. And I would say this, this factory recommended line on the ARV 94 makes more sense than on the 88. I don't think too many people should be going back there. No, it seems pretty dedicated as a competition yeah. ski. But I, you know, I could see, I could see you buying this ski in a 185 and mounting on that factory recommended line and having a great time. I can see that as well. And then I would go 178, mount it right on that freestyle line and have a great time as well. I would get the ARW because I like the graphic better. In fact, I owned this ski and then Armada told me to send it back because they had to like do some assessment of how it fared through me skiing it. I would demand to see those results. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually tried to demand an ARV 100, which hasn't happened yet, but yeah. I will continue to try and... Yeah. Demand is the wrong word. Ask nicely. I, I ask very nicely. Yeah. I'd like to ski an ARV 100 more. Uh, but no, I think that ski's awesome. Yeah. I, like, I truly think it's... I, I think it's important to look at it through the lens of twin tips, but through the lens of twin tips, I think what Armada did with the ARV line is some of the most impressive stuff that we saw in any new 2024 ski. That Those and Playmakers really, I think, are... It's impressive what they accomplished with new construction technology and the performance yeah. matches. I agree. Um, this is a K2 Poacher. I skied this a few times before seeing Colby Stevenson in the X Games and Olympics on it. Yeah. And was just shocked at how well he was able to use these in the park. Professional athlete. It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. You know, like skiing them is an extremely rewarding experience. Like yeah, this is a stable, fun. Yeah, it's entering into like Black Ops 98, Unleash yeah. 98. It's kind of getting into that zone of being totally. a free ride twin tip that has, uh, you know, a great amount of stabi stability, durability, you know, just ease of use, but still like feels like something on your feet. Yeah. But then seeing a professional athlete take this into an X Games or Olympics style park yeah. and just go huge. He goes huge. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that. I was like, no, they put that graphic on a different ski. No, they don't. Yeah. And I was really impressed. So yeah. anyone who's wondering if this has the capability of being a high-performance park ski, like you can put that to rest. 
Yeah, you know, I really like it when we see these high-level athletes doing things on skis that most people think aren't, that's, a, that's not an application. Yeah. Um, but it is. Yep. Uh, a lot of this weight, 2,030 grams, comes from a blend of fir and aspen. So fir, a little denser wood on the outside, aspen yeah, it's like in basically the middle. the same construction as here. They have, both have that carbon boost braid, yep. but then this adds fir. Fir. And then we still get that same... Um, triaxial fiberglass in here as well. So we're adding that energy and stiffness through the glass. But <clears throat> really fun ski, you know, 96 underfoot, incredibly versatile. This can be on the feet of like a 75 year old out there just making his way down the hill. Yeah, 100%. As easily as it can be on the feet of an athlete like Colby Stevenson. Yeah, yep. Which I think is an, a very impressive thing. Um, from these K2s. Yeah, no, they're they're really awesome. Um, we had Casey. I have footage. That's the reason I bring it up. We okay. Had Casey on it at the ski test, and I um, chasing around Casey on that ski with a camera. It felt like such a good Casey ski. Yep. Because he skis pretty fast. You know, he's like he works in mountain operations, and he needs a durable, long-lasting ski. And like he's also a really good skier, and needs like true all mountain performance and something that'll like satisfy a yep. an aggressive adult but then he skis in the park a lot right and he's like very very jibby and agile with his skiing and like super super stylish and i just felt like that matched yeah matched a casey really nicely it has the rocker of that more free ride ski too or yeah nice and long rocker and the shovel here it's not as dramatic camber underfoot, kind of a little bit closer to what we saw with Elan, um, and then long tail rocker as well. And then we kind of get this more sharply rounded shape in the tips yeah, and in little, the tails. A little pointier. A little pointier. And like not a ton of splay either. Like the, the flatter profile, the lower profile, really kind of puts this thing more into that all mountain and free ride realm. But again, if it's winning X Games and Olympic medals, like there's obviously a competitive park performance to this thing, but it's just not for everybody. Whereas something that's more accessible, I think has more to offer Well, and it's, developing it's, it's skiers. It's interesting just bringing that ski into the conversation that we were having back here with like, yeah. you just have to kind of think about feel and like which one matches your feel as a park skier more yeah if you're the big strong i go huge on jumps skier poacher enters this conversation 100 yeah. percent with its its strength its stability on landings and also its durability like i've right. i've had um i've had athletes kids that i coach where mostly their parents are just like panicked and they're like Jimmy, I don't coach anyone named Jimmy, but Jimmy <laughs> always feels like a nice, just like it's a safe name, a yeah. safe name for my kid. Um, they're like, Jimmy has broken five pairs of skis in the last three years. Like, what are we going to do? And I'm like, well, Jimmy skis, Jimmy hits like 10,000 rails in a year. And like, that's something that's going to happen. But generally that person ends up on a poacher Yeah. or that skier ends up on a poacher because I... I have yet to come across a ski that has proven itself as more durable. Will some of these new skis with modern construction techniques, will they surpass it? I don't know because not enough time has gone by yeah. to really be able to definitively say that, but I can definitively say that the poacher is just about the most durable ski I've ever encountered. It's just got that solid feel to it. Very solid. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, dimensions wise, 124, 96, 118. So more directional, more all mountain. Very similar to that ARV 94. Yeah. And this is a 177, but 19 meter radius in the 184. So a little bit longer as well. Yeah. But really cool ski. Love these things. Yeah. And then uh, I always kind of, for a long time, I felt like Poacher was a little bit on its own. There weren't too many twin tips that like really could kind of that could compete against its combination of performance attributes and durability and strength and all those things. And Until then, now. and then Vocal went out and <laughs> yeah. made a poacher. Yeah, <laughs> um, they not 
didn't exactly make a poacher, but there are a lot of similarities between Revolt 96 here and poacher. That surprises me. How, well, this is the 181, so it's a what's longer... The, what's the poacher that you just had, 177? 20, yeah, 177. All right. Well, just over 2,100 grams here, so even a little bit heavier. Um, and I think they feel, they feel substantial when you ski them, for sure. If you did a blind test, I would have somewhat of a difficult time. I think Choose, that, like, so you want to do the blindfold ski test? Yeah. <laughs> no, but yeah. <laughs> this one is just this the roundness of the flex. I find the flex softer, yeah. yes, but it is a touch heavier. Um, but yeah, Revolt 96 here, I think this is an awesome ski, and I felt like Rev Vocal as a brand, they needed to update that Revolt 95. It mm -hmm. had been there for a long time, and it had basically been like surpassed by this ski and then Revolt 104 from like a shaping concept perspective and just like modern progression of skis. And then the yeah. 95 just felt like left behind sort of. This ski, I now feel like really does a good job bridging the gap between Revolt 90 and Revolt 104. And if you think about those two skis and their their strengths and their purpose and like who should be skiing them and what they're really good at. Take take all of that performance and just mash it together and that you get the Revolt 96. So yeah. it's not as good of a park ski as Revolt 90. It's not as good in soft snow as Revolt 104. Neither of those things is terribly surprising, uh, but it's pretty darn good in both both those worlds. So I had a blast skiing this thing this past year. Um, I skied it in the park a lot, and I never found like the weight was, it wasn't like holding me back. Mm -hmm. I, I really enjoyed skiing this in the park. It didn't feel the quickest on like small rails and stuff like that, but I felt like the, the trade-off of quickness for stability and strength and, and confidence was, was pretty nice to have. Feels great on landings. And then we'll look at its shape in just a second. I think it's got a really nice forgiving shape. That flex pattern's key. Yeah, and that's what I like most about it and not something that I would have thought on paper was right. going to apply to my style. I think it just helps counter the weight. I mean, yeah. I think when you've got a ski this heavy, if it was really stiff too, then like what, what would be the purpose of that uh, in, you gotta, in a twin tip? Yeah, you got to have the flex to access the side cut. Yeah. Which, and this one, I believe, is a little bit on the longer side, um, but the it side doesn't cut. feel like it. The, yeah, the radius. Uh, I think it's like 19 or 20 or something. Is it not on there? No, of course not. Of course not. <laughs> we'll put it up on the screen, similar to how I did before. Um, but I talked about 104 before. There's definitely some 104 influence in its shape. Yep. Like the amount of rocker here is, is pretty crazy. Same thing is true in the tail, just the amount of tail rockers off the charts. So nice, like forgiving, easy going ski. And then interestingly, it's not perfectly centered mount point, but really, really close. And that Revolt 95 was always true was center. True center yeah. There was only one line on that ski. So. Although this thing is good as an all mountain ski, and it is like, let's see, this is on here. 126, 96, 117. So, you know, almost back to a full centimeter difference yep. in tip to tail width. So it is more of a, more of a directional side cut profile, I suppose you could say, but it is still intended to be a park ski, a freestyle ski. Whether you're strictly skiing in the park or whether you're gonna do a little bit of everything and maybe not going to the park that much at all, you still should be mounting it pretty darn close to true center. I kept bumping back on the demo binding. I think I might have gone like three notches back, which is about a, a centimeter and a half. Yeah, now see, um, the, problem, the problem with that, and if you follow that method and keep going, is you're going to get into the tail rocker too soon. Yep. You know, so like... And even from a drill perspective, like you can't go past there right. with, with a heel piece. So there's like physically a limit to how far back you can mount this thing. I mean, you do feel the tail. Like in a carved turn, you really feel the tail hooking it 
Yeah. It's pretty awesome. Yeah. But it's not like punishing because it's nope. soft. Yeah, it bends. Yeah. So they basically made a poacher. It's just a little softer. <laughs> and my biggest complaint about this ski is that it stops at 181. Like that, I feel like this ski is screaming for a 186 or a 187. And the, the 95 did that too, right? Yeah, it was yeah. maddening. Yeah. And a lot of skis in this range for me top out a little bit shorter than, than I would like or any big skier, I, I would say. Do you want to finish this, this comparison with a, a comment poll? On um, best graphic, best revolt graphic? No. <laughs> <laughs> so yes or no question. Do you wish Vocal didn't include the animals? Oh, are you asking me? I'm asking the audience. My answer is yes. I, if, I think that's a cool graphic. <laughs> yeah, take out the hornet. Yeah. And keep the stripes going. I just, I don't like skis that imply a right and a left, but aren't right and left specific. Sure. Because I just... You wouldn't you'd have I a hard cannot, time doing that. I can't ski like that. Fair enough. So that's my other big complaint other than a long length. I just, I just feel like the... I don't want to give my opinion away. Would you think if I do, it'll affect the answers to my comment poll? Probably not at this point in the video. Yeah, we've, we've, <laughs> we've, we've gone far beyond that. Um, I feel like the Hornet makes it feel like childish, and I feel like there's nothing about that ski that's childish. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Well, they make this graphic in the kids' version. Yeah, but why do we need to do, know, they, why do we need to do that? Right. They should have started there. I'm sure they started here and worked worked it into yeah the junior version. You can put a hornet on the kids ski. Yeah, I don't hate the hornet. <laughs> I just I feel like it might open itself up to a new new audience if yeah. they if it didn't have a hornet on it. Yeah, and for such a capable cool ski, it's like kind of a bummer. Yeah, well, I agree. I would I think it would have been better without it. Um, last question. Okay. Vocal's a major ski manufacturer. Mm -hmm. I know the answer to why they don't do this, but would, and feel free to leave a comment. Do you think it would be cool if they made them in Germany? Probably. Some so of the, which some ones of the revolts. Are, which we, ones are these? We wouldn't need to do all of them. These were made in China. Yes, I know. Okay. So would you, as a ski, consumer and skier would you feel better about buying a revolt if it was made in germany i don't know like for me it depends on which side of you're looking at are you looking at it from a quality control perspective or something else uh, i think you got to throw price in there or price because i think it, it would probably would go up yeah a hundred dollars maybe but this is these are guesses yeah but i think they are would, a good deal i think it would be interesting yeah and now I've, I've presented this question to Vocal, and I really enjoyed their answer, because they would like to. Yeah. For now, it's a production quantity thing. Yeah. They just can't, they don't have room in their production facilities. They I'm, make too many other skis. They make skis. too many skis. Yeah. yeah. But no I do think, having talked to Vocal about it, I think it's something that we'll see yeah. someday. Like, I think it'd be cool if like, they did like 96, 104. Right, kind of the marquee models. Yeah. Yeah. And like I think as we've talked about, the the twin tip customer is less price conscious than they ever have been before. Yep. As the twin tip market ages, I think Vocal could sell an eight hundred and fifty dollar park ski. Yeah, I mean we were impressed with the value of this. Yeah. Also like Bent ninety. Totally. Just not terribly expensive skis. Yeah. Yeah. So Anyways, just raising some questions sure. to finish the video yeah, here. All about it. Um, and that was really fun. Yep. As I thought would happen, there, there's some gray area in here. You know, I think there are arguably more similarities on this wall than any other comparison that we do. But I think even among those skis that are very similar, say these three right here, there are things you can point to for differences.
Yeah, and it might be one of the biggest, like 84 to 96, like 12 millimeters yeah, like for it's width. Big. It's a big, big gap. Yep. So that was fun. Let us know if you have any twin tip questions, as usual. Um, if they're more park focused, you can ask me specifically. If they're more non-park focused, feel free to ask Bob yep. specifically in the comments. More than happy to let you know what we think. And uh, I'm looking forward to skiing a lot of these skis up here more this totally. season. <laughs> so, yeah, let us know if you have any questions, and we will talk to you soon. Bye.